Good morning and welcome to you all. My name is Paul Groom, the director of DHUB, your host today. My fellow presenters and I send you all our very best wishes and hope that you are safe and well during these difficult times. We do appreciate your time and thank you for attending our webinar, Wellness in the Workplace, Protecting Your Employees. I would also like to thank our partner programme who have made this webinar possible today. The members include the Department of International Trade, Amazon Web Services, the Bahrain British Business Forum, Bahrain Chamber of Commerce, Rink Hotelco, Protection RE, Tamkeen, and Impact. Our agenda today, what I'd like to do initially is set the scene for wellness globally, regionally, and locally. And then I will hand over to Mr. Tom Ham, General Manager of Standby, a Bahraini company specializing in risk management. And Tom will go through planning your recovery roadmap. Dr. Gardini Al Safa will then take over. Dr. Gardini will talk about mental stress, its detection, support, and risk avoidance in the workplace. And then Mr. Tim King, the Chief Exec of SOSA Health, will discuss how wellness can impact on COVID 19 prevention and also physical support through corporate wellness assessments. And then finally, we have Professor Mark Lewis, Dean of Loughborough University School of Sport, Exercise and Health, who will discuss the importance of lifestyle interventions on performance. The result that we're all hoping for is for you, the audience, to gain insights and knowledge, promoting you to take additional action in your quest and hard work to provide your team with help and support during the COVID-19 crisis and beyond. Today is not about hand washing, sanitizing the environment. It's about people and creating confidence and safety for you, the employer, your employees, your customers, supporting you in all achieving your goals, improving safety and confidence. So setting the scene, physical inactivity is a global, regional and local problem. Later, Professor Mark Lewis will discuss the global numbers for physical inactivity. However, I just wanted to set the scene by putting some figures from The Lancet, which was published way back in 2012, stating that if physical inactivity in our region, the MENA region was removed, then 44,000 lives lost to cardiovascular disease in 2008 could have been saved. 525,000 lives lost to all forms of non-communicable disease in 2008 also could have been saved. Also that people in the age bracket of 50 and above, if they move from an inactive lifestyle to an active lifestyle, can add a further 3.7 years to their life expectancy. And for those of us who are in that bracket, I think we'd take that offer uh, now. Whilst these numbers are some time ago, I think sadly the situation, they won't have improved in the ensuing years and potentially have declined. So wellness on a global context, it's a phrase and it's a practice that's been developing over the years and some pre-COVID facts. PricewaterhouseCooper did a report that a wellness program can reduce staff turnover by 10%, which I think any HR director would welcome that news, uh, cutting that dramatically on recruitment costs. 74% of European CBRE occupiers have a wellness program in place. And in America, 80% of all employees polled suggested that they would want to work 
and stay with a company have, have a wellness offering embedded in their culture. Some pre-COVID numbers, absenteeism in the UK back in 2006, lost 175 million working days at a total cost of $27 billion. Stress-related absenteeism in the UK, 10.4 million days lost per annum. And absenteeism and presenteeism in the US, the cost is estimated per annum at $227 billion. And finally, an EU report by Matrix in 2013 valued work-related depression at 727 billion per annum. These numbers are staggering and indicate that the global and regional trajectory of health is possibly not a positive one. And all this was before the start of COVID-19 earlier. So we're now in the COVID-19 era and it will continue to impact on people's lives, their physical and mental state as we've seen in the last six months. We're using new phrases like new normal, hybrid working, and all these are being worked on in the workplace and it's still being defined as we go through that journey. There is, however, a real underlying concern that returning to school, university or work is a concern for a lot of people. Why? Uh, we've seen in the last six months that the most physically underprepared were and still are the most vulnerable. So those with pre-existing conditions. And I guess now people are still worried because they lack knowledge of their own health condition. We also realize that despite the press, vaccine timing is a little unknown. Huge amounts of investment are being made. Yet until a vaccine is proven, manufactured in bulk, distributed around the globe, taken and proven to be effective, then we possibly won't see a return to our 2019 lifestyles until the year 2022. So COVID-19 strategy is not just distancing and cleansing, social distancing, it's really about people and safety as well. So what we're advocating is a, two, is a COVID-19 people strategy that will enable everybody to reduce risk and build confidence. The next phase, incorporating that safety and confidence, it's enabling people to return to the workplace for mental and social health reasons, but safely. Organisational health, wellness and safety, be it essential, is however one of the key dynamics to returning economic and health, prosperity and recovery. We do applaud, recognise the huge amount of efforts that's been undertaken by you in the audience, government and businesses all over Bahrain, the GCC and the world in trying to define what that new normal is and try and get back onto that recovery trajectory. Within that, I'm sure that you're building safety and wellness policies that will define whether your workforce is as effective as you would like. And of course, they're looking to you for leadership. Please remember, healthy people run and manage healthy companies better. If I'm ill, if I'm off work, then I'm not as effective. So without further ado, I'd like to thank you for listening and I'd like you to welcome our first speaker, Mr. Tom Ham, General Manager of Standby Consulting in Bahrain.
Tom, unmute yourself. Tom, there unmute you go. yourself. Thank you. Got it. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Paul. Thanks for the introduction. Um, uh, as Paul said, I'm, I'm Tom Ham, General Manager of Standby Consulting Middle East. We specialize in uh, business continuity, op operational resilience, um, as well as sort of IT transformation uh, and IT project management as well. Now, obviously, the line of work we've we're in um, in the last few months we've been speaking a lot about how do we how do we respond to covid how do we recover from covid how do we deal with those impacts and minimize the damage um, but now people are settling into what is a sort of temporary normal you know you found found a place where we can sit for a while um, and now it's all about planning our resumption how can we get back to a strong place how can we bring our people back how can we get our operations functioning as we want um, but we're probably not going to return to that, that, that old normal. It'll be that new normal because it's a very different world today. Um, so I, I'm going to talk a little bit today about how, what activities you can carry out within the business to plan your resumption, to make sure you can build confidence with your staff, to come back at the right, at the right time, at the right stage, and also obviously then be able to come back to the environment you want to come back to. And then I'll leave it to a few of the experts after me to talk a little bit more about how you would incorporate that with, with your people and, and what things you should be focusing on in terms of the wellness side. So as I said, the world has changed um, and business must change with it. A few points here. Uh, there's a heavy increase in remote working, as we know, increase in virtual events. Couple of um, couple of points on that recent Gartner study of, of CFOs around the world, 74% of them plan to move at least 5% of their workforce permanently remote. Another 25% said they would move 20% of their workforce permanently remote, and at least 4% plan to leave at least half their workforce remote. So that's going to be a big shift in our working patterns and what what we expect from our people and what they expect from us. Online meetings, Microsoft has said that there's about 20 million meeting participants on their Teams network every day. Now that's just one of the networks, one of the platforms, Zoom, Google, all of the others. That's a lot of people talking in different ways that they used to. Uh, we look a bit down the list, you know, we've got higher awareness of health and safety. People have daily less travel increase in time spent with family. These are all things that have changed and people will expect to keep on changing. Now they're comfortable in this, now they know they can work uh, effectively while still seeing more of their family. That's what they'll be aiming for. That's what they'll expect you as an employer, as a business to supply to them. Same in customer channels. People now have different platforms. They expect the online platform to work. They expect to be able to shop when, wherever they like. And, and all, of this, all of this needs to be incorporated into what we plan next. In terms of actually the operations of the business, we've got things like remote outsourcing, you know, it's much more acceptable. A good example of that is we are currently implementing an IT, uh, a new IT infrastructure in Jeddah. Now we have, at one point, I'm back in Bahrain now, but at one point I was in the UK, we had a consultant here in Bahrain, we had uh, another senior consultant in New Zealand. We had two vendors, one in Egypt and another one in the UAE, all implementing a new IT platform in Jeddah. Now that would have never happened six months ago, but expectations and people's confidence in these things are, are changed significantly. Other things we look at, supply chains are much more fragile than we thought and things like business interruption insurance might not cover everything. So when we look to build back, we also have to think about are our current and are our new structures resilient? Are we building back in the right way? Have we got the right platforms in place that if the supply chain breaks down, we've got a local provider, at least as a secondary source? Do we have things that we won't need that business interruption because we've thought of different channels of revenue, that we understand what our customer wants, and how quickly we can get new things to them and how agile we can be. So we just have to work on all these things and think about all of the different changes and how it's gonna affect our planning for the new normal. 
Uh, on the screen here are obviously a number of different elements that you can think about when you're planning the new normal. Now, one of the things I'll ask you is how many of you have actually carried out a lessons learned activity in the last you know, few months? How many of you have been tracking all the things that have been changed? Probably not that many of you. Probably what's happening is we're saying, okay, well, we'll wait to this to end and then we'll look at all our changes. But the, the length of this disaster pandemic changes along the way and we need to make sure we're tracking them all along the way because if we know where we've been we know where we are that's how we know where we got to go to so we need to be looking at all our business requirements our operations our supply chains and see where have we been stretched where have we been pulled um, what's changed what's the risks and what are our opportunities as well what are the new innovations we've found along the way now we could spend hours on on every single one of these elements, but we're just today going to look a bit about this, the business requirements, the staff welfare, our leadership, you know, and our operations really, and how we can bring back and build confidence to our staff and customers. Now I'm going to talk about a couple of activities that you can carry out within the business if you're not already. And, and this is the first one, and this is planning your new normal. This is where, and what we'll use here is, is on the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see products and services. Now, if you've got a, a resilience or a BC plan already in place, then there's a good chance you already know what your critical products, your critical services in the business are. And you've probably assessed how quickly they need to be back, what dependencies they have, who you need to, to bring them back, and, and you'll have all that information. But what we want to do is, is understand that and in terms of what of our changes happen. So for each of our services, each of our products, what is our objective? You know, what, if we're paying salary, when do we want to pay by? Who do we want to pay? And then we look at that against our current status. So one of the examples here is pay suppliers. So you may want to pay within 30 days. However, with all the interruption and the change of people, people working remotely, not being able to cross information so much, getting sign offs, we might only be paying with 60 days currently. Um, so we have to start rating that and we have to understand, is it good? Is it better? Is it, is it worse? Um, and then we have to look at sustainability. So how long can we actually keep this new normal going for? You know, how long will people accept what our new operations are? We, how long will our staff be happy with their slightly unpredictable home internet line? Or will customers or clients understand the child screaming in the background? Now, We've all been on meetings and there's a child knocking on the door or running in and there's a community environment at the moment and everybody's happy with that. But once we start getting back to normal, once people expect new things, will they be happy with your workforce working from home in, in, their, um, in their lounge? So this is what I want to do. And then from all of that information, we can make recommendations of what our new normal is going to be. Do we want to keep our services as they are? Do we want to change them? How can we change them? And I would recommend all of you do this within your business and go through all of the things, all of the products, all of the services, see one by one how they're changing and how they can change. Obviously, one of the keys is not just your external services, or external operations, but you also have to look at all your stakeholders. So your staff training, your staff mentoring, you know, we have the online platforms have given a huge amount of extra training of new new portals that people can use but we've lost that one-on-one -on -one, that mentoring that extra bit a lot of the time you know the, the online courses can teach you 90 percent. they can make you good at what you do but often it's that one-on-one -on -one personal stuff that mentoring that watching somebody and experience that gets you that extra 10 percent that makes you makes you more confident in what you're doing and and then we have to look at the staff effectiveness, staff morale. Now, they're very much linked. If a staff is a member is effective and feels they're effective, they'll probably be happier in their workplace. Now, some people will prefer the flexibility of working remotely. Some people might not. Some people might actually prefer the rigidity of turning up to the office, knowing what they've got to do, walking away at five o'clock. And that has to be adapted. We can't just say it's working now, people working remotely. We have to understand long term, do certain people need certain things? Now, there are other things, obviously, we look at that and we can say, okay, well, what used to be what we were looking for in a good 
um, person within our company, you know, you might not that extrovert, that person that talks, that relates well. Now that might not be the case anymore. It might be that we, if someone online is much more effective. They're much better sat behind a screen. And suddenly our, our career progress, our metrics, for measuring what is progress, what is, um, what is success might have changed due to the new normal we're building. And then we have to look at other things as well. Things like supplier availabilities, regulator requirements, and they're all elements that we need to look at when we're planning our new normal. The second thing you then need to do, once you've kind of established where you want to be, you have to talk about, right, how are we going to get there? What do we need to put in place to get there? Now, this is another activity I'd, I'd recommend is worth doing and looking at, okay, in this example, we've got phase four, where we want to be is all staff return back to the office. Now that might not be the same for you, but you have to, you have to make these phases as you need. But what you have to understand is for each phase, only critical staff in phase two return. All staff return, but in split shifts in phase three. We have to understand what we need, what elements of the business, what dependencies we need to tick off before we can get to each of those phases. So our office layout, you know, how should staff be seated when we come back to phase two? Does it have to change to fit more people in in phase three and phase four? Building access, building hygiene, staff interaction, not just how they're interacting, but actually the policy on when they should be interacting or how close social distancing, etc. Government guidelines. We have to look at, actually, we want to bring our whole staff back, but are we allowed? How, what's our minimum amount of people the government must accept us to have in the office before we can move forward? And then there's obviously other things such as infrastructure, um, cyber security, system security, all of those things you need to make sure are in place as well to deal with the remote and local. And all of these are building not just your confidence that you can come back, but your staff confidence as well. Now, one of the, one of the good examples um, that I've seen is actually a friend of mine's company in Dubai. They've come back and they've got what is a traffic-like system. And they've got wristbands at their front reception and they're, they're red, orange, and green. And if you walk in and you wear the red wristband or the green wristband or the orange you pick, the green means, right, I'm happy to, to handshake, I'm happy to hug, it's just good to see you, I want to interact. Orange means I don't mind speaking, socially distance, but I don't want to actually touch. And they've got red that means actually I'm vulnerable or I don't want to, to come anywhere near you, I'm just here to work. And what again that builds is that staff confidence to go back to the office place to be ready. And then we're talking today about wellness and health, and that's obviously a major one that has to be assessed, that we have to say, right, what are our critical minimum standards for our staff health? Do we wait for a vaccine? Are we going to supply a vaccine when it comes as a business? Do we wait till we can test all the staff for antibodies? Now, as yet, things like that aren't known whether it's going to last, um, but we have to look at all these things to, to give our minimum standards. And, and all of that, once we have our minimum standards, once we know our phase two, our phase three, our phase four, we can effectively bring our staff back in confidence. We know that what we're doing should mean we can go for a while and we can, and our staff can come through confidently and come to work. And that's the important one. So I'm gonna wrap it up there, hopefully, uh, there's a few good points for you to go away and do and hopefully there's some activities that you can you can gather some confidence from um all i would say now is just to um to carry out these activities if you're not already get your management and key stakeholders together and brainstorm the next steps carry out the lessons learned review what you want to be your new normal and and pace yourself and phase your recovery um, and obviously we're, you know, we're here to help a bit of a, you know, if you want anything, standby consulting website is there for downloads. All of these ideas I've put, we actually have some templates online. So please feel free to, to contact us or just visit our website if you need any help with, with getting the, the business back to where you need it to be. Thank you very much. And I, I hope you enjoy the rest of the webinar. Thank you, Tom, very much. Very interesting and very insightful. Um, 
it now gives me great pleasure to introduce to you our next speaker, Dr. Gardenia Al Safa. Gardenia is one of the first Bahraini psychiatrists to graduate from the Royal College of Psychiatrists in London and is a leading psychiatrist at the Royal Hospital in Bahrain. So over to you, Dr. Gardenia. Thank you, Paul. Um, so mental well-being is something we've been talking about more intensively over the past few years, I'd say, and trying to remove the stigma from mental illness and psychological distress has been a big part of what I've been doing. Today, I want to talk about stress and burnout, which have always been real issues in the workplace, but with the COVID-19 pandemic, they've come to the forefront as their effects have been astounding on mental well-being. Um, the, there's a lot of distress that people are complaining from. And if we don't address this, it's definitely going to affect productivity. I'll start off with definitions. So well-being, as we, as we talk about it, is an experience of health, happiness, and prosperity, and a high quality of life, which are a product of both mental and physical health, a sense of fulfillment, meaning, and purpose in one's life. And this is a very important point, a successful work-life integration, so finding the right balance. On the other end of the spectrum, we have distress. Distress is a negative mental state. It results from a low quality of life and decreased meaning in one's work and the dimensions that may impact an individual both personally and professionally. So as you can imagine, with a high and sustained level of distress, there are several factors that you start noticing. Irritability, severe fatigue, uh, people complaining from a poor quality of life, they start making mistakes at work, losing interest in their work, losing that work-life integration we're talking about, and complaining of burnout. And sometimes it gets to the point where people are thinking about ending their lives in suicidal ideation. So burnout is not a medical diagnosis. Let's just be clear about that. It's, it's a syndrome resulting from work-related stress. It's characterized by high emotional exhaustion. So, so those um, negative feelings that we experience and we're readily, should be readily able to express such as sadness, irritability, fatigue, a high sense of depersonalization. So just feeling like not yourself, feeling detached from your environment, disillusioned, having difficulty concentrating. Cynicism, just generally not feeling appreciated or not feeling like what you're doing is making an impact and a low sense of personal accomplishment. So as I said, it's not, a person, it's not a medical diagnosis, but it can definitely lead to other diagnoses such as anxiety and depression. There are several inventories and indices that we can use to detect it. The most commonly used nowadays is the Maslach burnout into inventory. Um, once in the workplace, you're recognizing increased absenteeism in the staff, a deterioration in performance, it might be recommended to have these inventories at hand. The pandemic has put us at a higher risk for burnout just because of the way it's affected our lives. Um, there's been a disruption, a clear disruption in the work-life balance where practicing social distancing, it's turned into a level of isolation. People are identifying much more strongly with their jobs, so they're working harder, they're spending more time at work, um, working from home has also made it difficult to set a cutoff time for work. It's no longer the case that you're able to say, I'm leaving the office and I'm not working anymore. Um, there's been an increase in workload, an increase in overtime. There's been, unfortunately, redundancies, which have been unavoidable. People are scared of finding themselves redundant. And that's led people to work even harder in the face of jobs, the lack of job security. That alongside the fact that people are taking on an increased 
of responsibilities in the workplace and at home. You're now taking care of elder, elderly family members, you're taking care of children. So people are, in essence, spreading themselves out even thinner than they were in the past. Um, we're experiencing a sense of lack of control. As Tom mentioned, we don't know when this vaccine is going to come into place. We don't know how long this is going to go on for. And that uncertainty is not something that human beings tolerate very well, especially over a long period of time. Alongside the sense of monotony that we're experiencing, social distancing, social isolation has taken away a lot of the activities that we used to do during our weekends or take a break, et cetera. And, and that's adding to our risk of burnout. Now, the consequences of burnout are, they're not limited to excessive stress or feelings of fatigue. It can result in insomnia, depression, anxiety, as I mentioned earlier, alcohol and substance abuse, an increased incidence of heart disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, general vulnerability to illness all around, and even unexplained physical symptoms. We're seeing more headaches coming into our clinics, more stomach discomfort, more bowel problems, various other physical complaints when we're not able to express ourselves or tolerate the, the stress, they, things start manifesting in a physical way in our body. So in the workplace, burnout can affect us in different ways. We're talking about job withdrawal, people are wanting to leave work, there's absenteeism, high turnover, reduction in productivity, general ineffectiveness, people are unhappy with their jobs, there's an increased rate of, decrease, of job satis decreased job satisfaction, a reduced commitment to the job, to the organization, greater interpersonal conflict with colleagues, and this all kind of causes disruption. So what can we do about this? I'm gonna break this down into how the individual can prevent burnout and how as an organization we can help people prevent burnout. It seems pretty commonsensical, but it, it still has to be said, we need to maintain regular a regular healthy routine and lifestyle. Things like sleeping at a consistent time and getting enough hours. Just one hour of sleep reduction and the amount of sleep that you need over a week can actually build up. Diet, we need to stick to our regular diet habits. When we're not in a, in a very structured timing and schedule, it's very easy to forget meals or to start grazing on food and we need to be more aware of that exercising regularly, and that means once a day at least. Sunlight, in spite of us in this being in this part of the world, it needs to be said, because we end up avoiding the sun because of how hot it is, but the sun is a very important part in maintaining our well-being, a positive mental state, and avoiding depression. Self-care, I have to stress, it used to be the case that when we talk about self-care, we're talking about a day off at the spa or hanging out with friends, but this, 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 is actually a deeper form that we need to focus on. We need to focus on being more practical with ourselves, being more forgiving, avoiding perfectionism. It is not the time right now to expect everything to be ideal. We need to be more realistic with our expectations and set more achievable goals. And we need to make sure to prioritize the individual. It's important to schedule pleasurable activities. I, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, with work becoming how people feel productive and, and feel engaged within society, we're forgetting engaging in the pleasurable activities. Things that you used to enjoy doing in the past, whether it's reading or listening to music or whatever it is. And finally, maintaining social connections. I feel like this is not said enough. It's social distancing not social isolation. We've got all kinds of mediums that can, we can use to connect with people and we need to schedule that into our everyday lives. So moving on to how the employer can help the employee. So improved job satisfaction. The first one seems to be commonsensical, which is paying a fair wage, but in all fairness, in this kind of economic environment, 
it's very difficult to do. So we're going to move on to discussing a point that's further down the list. And that's kind of being honest with the employee if pay cuts are necessary so that they're expecting it and they feel like they're part of the decision making process. So the second point there is fostering a sense of individual control and an ability to influence decisions. Like Tom mentioned, certain people find it more difficult to work from home versus the office and setting diff different schedules with, like I have at home, basically kids homeschooling. So being able to allow your staff as much flexibility in that area will improve job satisfaction. Um, improving the work-life balance, so clearer job expectations, limiting working hours, telling the staff that they need to be, that the communication, for example, needs to be stopped at a specific period of time so that they can actually engage in social activities. And scheduling vacation time, this is a very important point. Um, last night, as I was discussing with my husband, he said, not vacation, call it staycation. The problem is we need to actually take that time off work. It shouldn't be associated with leaving the country or traveling. We need to be able to take a break from work and do something else. And that time needs to be scheduled. Don't allow the staff to delay that any longer, especially if they haven't taken time off in the past six months. They definitely need that break. Um, we need to support a healthy workplace environment, respect, zero tolerance for bullying, and increasing interpersonal engagement. I spoke to someone who said in the course of three months, the only communication that they had with their workplace because they were working at home was through email. They had no human interaction and they found that extremely frustrating. So we need to stress that um, the importance of communicating with the staff and allowing them to feel that they are a valued part of the organization, letting them know that they do matter. Um, talking about the future right now with all of the uncertainty we're experiencing is very important. This honest and open relationship is what will keep the staff engaged and keep them feeling like they're part of the team. And finally, and maybe most importantly, we need to prioritize mental well-being. It needs to be something that we are comfortable talking about. We're comfortable discussing on a day-to-day -day basis. Allowing a mental health day and calling it that as opposed to having to call for a sick leave, saying you can take that one mental health day. Offering and destigmatizing met mental health services, offering exercise facilities or gym memberships, and keeping the staff engaged and motivated is going to always be the responsibility of the managers. So we need to keep HR and the managers trained in how to do that and how to allow it. So bottom line is, it's a lot of work we need to do and keeping connected is the most important part of it and keeping communication open. Thank you, Paul. Dr. Gardinia, that was brilliant. Thank you very, very much. Um, it was very important that you were uh, here today. Um, I know that when people have got a physical injury and we've got a pot on our arm because we've broken our, our arm, people give sympathy. But when it's something psychological, then very, very often it goes oh, they've just got a mood or it's whatever. And I think for an employer to recognize some of the challenges that staff are going through and support that through the COVID situation is, is, is absolutely essential. So that was brilliant. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Thank you. So the next presenter is Mr. Tim King. Tim is the Chief Executive Officer of Sosa Health, and he's going to uh, give us a very insightful presentation into corporate wellness. Over to you, Tim. Paul, thank you very much, and uh, thank you, everybody, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for joining this webinar. I'm going to talk a little bit about Sosa. I'm going to talk about uh, preventative health in the workplace, and then I'm going to 
offer a challenge uh, to you all as uh, business leaders. Um, so, so let's get started. A uh, little bit about Sosa Health. It was uh, the vision of a gentleman called Lord Wolfson of Sunningdale. Back in the late 80s, he posed the question, why do we get ill? And he put $10 million of his family money uh, behind finding out the answer to that question. Uh, his family, the Wolfson family, um, have given hundreds of millions of, do of dollars over the past four decades to, to medical research all around the world. Uh, the research team reviewed existing peer-reviewed medical literature for eight years, and then David, Lord Wolfson, uh, invested another $3 million and, and five years uh, of effort in uh, commissioning SOSA to build a, what we call a health scoring model. What was driving all of this was his belief that national healthcare systems around the world cannot continue to cope with demand and therefore something needs to be done to reduce the demand curve of, of healthcare. So the brief that he set SOSA was to develop some simple tests that gave immediate results to make sure that the results and the guidance given uh, to the individual was personalized and that the whole process had to be mobile so that this could be taken into organizations, into corporates and delivered on site, um, uh, taking, no, taking an individual away from their desk for no more than one hour. So we think we, um, succeeded on the brief. This is a photo of all the medical devices that we use and as you can see it fits on a regular size uh, desk in a, in a corporate enterprise environment. The data we collect on the laptop is then uploaded to the cloud where our algorithms will then work out how well your body is performing and if not at 100% specifically what you need to do uh, to fix it. What have we learned um, as we've gone through the COVID uh, academic? Well, I've really been hearing three things. The first one is um, in the press and um, around the virtual dinner party table is that underlying health conditions matter. Um, if you are fit and healthy and young, you have a much better chance of surviving the virus. If you are older or less healthy, um, your, your chances of survival are much reduced. That over time then led to the question, how at risk am I individually? And, and how do we answer that question? And what we're now seeing is the question, is it safe to get back to work? And you've heard some uh, strategies um, being discussed of how uh, that might come about. Um, and particularly employees are now saying, it's up to my employer to make sure that they can demonstrate that it is safe for me to come back to work. So those are the three sort of COVID learnings that, that we've picked up on. So then there's a challenge. How do you measure health? How do you give an individual a health score? How do you level or measure their levels of mental and physical stress, their ability to handle stress, um, what they've got left in the tank, so to speak? Um, but importantly, in this era of COVID-19, what I call the COVID-19-3, uh, the three things that really affect your survivability chances, how well is your immune system performing, uh, how well is your respiratory system functioning, and what level of inflammation do you have in your body. Those three things um, are key influences in your survivability should you um, contract COVID-19. So what we're talking about here is health scoring. Um, Body systems are interconnected, so if your heart's not working well, it will drag down other parts of your body. But importantly, you don't feel ill until you are ill. So in other words, a lot happens before you wake up in the morning and say, I need to go see the doctor, or you have a health event that causes you to go to the hospital. But what is true is that it's very um, possible to measure pre-disease. It, it's possible to measure that you are, for example, 20% of the way towards type 2 diabetes before you yourself will actually feel any ill effects. Uh, and that is essentially what SOSA does. Uh, preventative health, measuring through assessment, 
then giving the individual personalized actionable advice and measuring the impact of that advice. How well does that individual improve their health if they follow that advice? Quick case study, uh, we went into a company called Dometic, a Swedish company that uh, operates globally. We assessed their UK head office staff on site, so nobody was away from their desk for more than one hour. This was pre-lockdown. Pre we delivered personal reports for each of their employees, um, and that information stayed with the employee. We then took the health data that we collected, anonymized it, and built an analytics dashboard for the business so we could explain where the health issues were within the business without betraying the privacy that an employee would expect uh, surrounding their, um, their health data. Uh, and SOS is based in the UK and therefore we have GDPR to, um, to think about. We were then requested by Dometic to uh, provide ongoing personalized uh, wellness, uh, managed wellness service, and we looked to partners to help us do that. Uh, we're looking to roll that out to other international offices. But I think probably the most important thing was the comment of Sophie Cohe, who is the UK managing director, and she said, Tim, attitudes to health have now changed in my office. People value this, people are doing something about it. Uh, this health is now important. It, it's, on our, it's on our agenda. Just to give you a very brief insight of the sort of analytics that we gave to the, to, to the organization, top left-hand corner, you see an over, overall uh, health score. This is the average health score for all the employees in that organization. And it's pretty much on trend on average. But what you'll notice just below is that the boys were scoring slightly better than the girls. And we went on to explain why. And we went on to explain that it was actually dehydration was driving the lower female scores. So if the female population fixed their dehydration issues, um, they could um, catch up and overtake the average male score, which is great news. We want health equality in any organization. And we sliced the data by uh, age groups, ethnicity, uh, gender, and we drill down into the, in, into the data. An example of that is looking at the heart system, which is the left-hand column, where you can see a wide range of scores. So the overall heart system, uh, the average score in the organization was 48%, uh, the best person 88%, the, 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 the lowest person 15%. This person was not aware that they had health problems. Uh, we sent them to the doctor. They needed, uh, they needed medical intervention. We passed them over to the medical professionals. And what you can see within this is that uh, the heart muscle, uh, the, uh, the heart risk, which is essentially your heart muscle, um, was scoring much better than the health of the arteries and capillaries of the individuals. And that's really where the major issue was, um, arteries and capillaries getting blocked. Um, and that's why we were advising certain individuals to go and seek medical attention. And I stress they were not aware that they were ill. Coming back to the COVID, and I talked about the COVID-3, this is the score for the immune system. Top right-hand corner, three people had an immune system low enough for us to be of concern, and we were advising them to take immediate action to improve their, hope, their, their immune system um, and most of that was diet and uh, exercise advice. The respiratory, only one person was under the threshold. Um, but again, you can see um, some differences. The organization, for example, was scoring an average of 78, which is pretty close to the population score um, of 81%. The highest score, 100%, so somebody had perfect respiratory system. Uh, the lowest score, 24%, and that person was, was given guidance uh, to go and seek medical assistance. And the same for in, inflammation score, although nobody was below the threshold for immediate assistance there. And then in talking to Sophie Quare, the MD, um, and they operate a, a number of warehouses, uh, we realized that it's not just about um, letting the individual know that they are at risk of um, uh, disease and obviously the impact that um, would, would, would happen if they 
um, for example, have a heart attack while driving the forklift truck. But that forklift truck itself could have hit the shelving and damaged stock, and those shelves could have fallen over and injured other employees. So having an individual who doesn't know that they're real is a very real risk for the business that can have massive financial and people consequences if that person suffers a, a health event while operating that expensive and, and dangerous machinery. So let's quickly talk about the benefits well, for the individual. Uh, they get a health and wellness score. They get a personalized preventative health care plan. If they follow the, the recommendations that we make in that personalized report, they will see improved health levels, energy levels will improve, re uh, reduce stress and better sleep. Um, and then going back to the COVID-19, the, the, the three things, uh, stronger immune and respiratory systems that they follow our guidance, uh, reduced underlying health conditions and therefore reduced personal risk from, from COVID. For the corporate employee health is important. That will drive productivity. Healthy employees um, will, uh, will be more productive. It will reduce absenteeism. If you have your employees working on their own individual health plans, it will reduce the risk in the business of adverse health effects affecting uh, events affecting the business. And I'm sure you can all figure out very easily that that will um, in itself produce a return on investment in financial terms, but also on the corporate social responsibility side, doing the right thing for your people, doing the right thing for your business means you're doing the right thing for your community and you're doing the right thing for the nation in encouraging your people to live uh, healthier lives. Um, so now the challenge for, for those of you who are leaders in your business, I won't go through all of these things, but SOSA and the preventative health program that we have allows, for example, businesses to address health inequality, to reduce litigation risk, to reduce absenteeism. So I challenge you all to become a wellness leader in your field. Uh, you're very welcome to talk to SOSA and see if we can help you do that. And finally, I just want to connect diet and exercise, not only to personal health, not only to personal health, sorry, the slides are gone um, ahead of me here. Um, diet and exercise clearly drives personal health, but it also helps risk management within a business and that will drive corporate performance. So really there is a personal benefit and there is, a, there is an enterprise uh, business benefit. I'm delighted to now hand you over to Professor Mark Lewis and also delighted to announce that SOSA is very proud to have partnered up with Loughborough University and we will be working with them to build on their excellence in the field of uh, exercise and nutrition. And I'm sure Mark will now talk uh, about that in a little more detail. So over to you, Mark, thank you. Firstly, uh, before Mark starts, I'd just like to thank you, Tim, for a very, very insightful presentation. Um, picking up on a couple of things, you know, how powerful it is for somebody to get a perspective on their own wellness before they become ill and to take charge of their own health program um, and also I think you know highly exciting the collaboration between SOSA Health and Loughborough. So a few words about Professor Mark uh, before he starts. Um, Mark is an international expert and Loughborough University and Mark advise the International Olympic Committee English Institute of Sport, the English Cricket Board, British Athletics, uh, the Rugby Football Union, and many, many more. So um, please listen because you're about to hear from a gentleman who knows what he's talking about. Over to you, Mark. Thank you very much, Paul. And um, good morning, everybody. It's really nice to have the opportunity uh, to speak to you today. Um, just a little bit about myself. Thank you uh, for that introduction. I think I moved uh, the slides on a bit too much there, so bear with me one second. So my background is um, um, a PhD in biochemistry. My background is physiology and biochemistry through Imperial College London Medical School 
time at UCL Medical School and now at Loughborough University, I become the Dean of the School of Sport, Exercise and Health Sciences and lead the National Centre for Sport and Exercise Medicine. And really what I want to try and do is pull together um, briefly all of the strands that you, you've just heard and how important it is, um, in my view, for us to understand that many of the things we're talking about, many of the pre-existing conditions which can predispose towards a, an unfavourable outcome or an unfavourable result from COVID-19 and many other health conditions as well, that's just the, the topic of the day, um, are manageable. They're non-communicable diseases, they're manageable by individuals. And I really want to emphasize through the course of this, um, the idea about ownership and personal ownership. Um, all the evidence sh shows that sustained healthcare changes or health, start, health and lifestyle changes come from individuals. And those individuals need help in doing that. And it, often it comes with tools to help manage that so they know where, where, their, where their state of health and wellbeing is. So the burden, this, this um, figure shows you the burden, uh, disease burden for non-communicable diseases uh, in the world, 1990 to 2017. Um, and I just think it, or you, can, you can investigate the details if you, if you wish. But I think the point is just absolutely um, the implication of um, the disease burden is 1.4 billion um, years of life lost and years of live with a disability. If you look down this right hand side, many of these conditions are manageable by individuals and even conditions where, such as cancers for example, where of course there are other elements at play, we even have evidence that, uh, that health and lifestyle can help manage um, those conditions as well. Um, Non-communicable diseases kill 41 million people each year, equivalent to about 71% of all deaths globally. And I keep going back to modifiable behaviours such as tobacco use, our previous speakers have alluded to this, physical inactivity, unhealthy diet, harmful use of alcohol, all increase the risk of non-communicable diseases. Um, our institution, um, again, I, you may have heard, um, and uh, Paul kind of introduced it, we are number one in the world, not measured by me, by others, in, in sport-related subjects. And although Paul mentioned a lot of the work we've done with um, sort of performance work, actually we do a huge amount of work with healthcare, National, the National Health Service in the UK and around the world. And all the lessons we've learned from those situations we are now translating over the last 10 to 20 years into, into the general population. Um, and fiscal inactivity is one of the largest contributors of, of a preventable condition, a non-communicable disease. And many of these things on this figure, so you see physical inactivity here, this is um, global. Um, it's the fourth most prevalent uh, condition which leads to mortality, which could be altered by behavior. And of course, many of you will of course realize that the, um, there are links between many of these things, high blood pressure, high blood glucose, overweight and obesity, cholesterol, um, we heard from our, our previous colleague, um, physical activity, people sitting in front of their screens all day, leads to maybe changes in their alcohol use. Um, we talk about people spending more time indoors. Again, my colleague mentioned about being outside in the sun. Um, there are issues around sort of in, internal um, air management, etc., etc. So many of these things are related. But this, when I look down all the list here, the thing I can pick out most, which I can manage, is physical inactivity because I can do something about that. The figures have shown uh, in the UK that in lockdown, the average, uh, the average person was spending uh, five minutes a day being physically active. Now, in some cases that was going from zero to five minutes and others that was people becoming, uh, adding another 25 to 30 minutes on their physical activity a week. Um, the five minutes is really important for somebody who has, is largely sedentary and inactive. Five minutes has the most dramatic changes in health outcomes that you can possibly imagine. That it, it, if, if it was a pill, we would be patenting this pill and selling it around the world um, to everybody because the, ch the changes are massive. Even, and even those people who are very active, who became more active, showed some increases in, in, in um, many health parameters, both, both physical and mental health. And I totally agree with Paul and previous speakers talk about the mental health aspect becoming very, very clear how important that is. Um, and I guess the point again here, just to reiterate, is personal ownership. Uh, in the previous presentation, Tim talked about, um, well, I like to talk about wellness rather than illness. Um, and, but however, wellness has a very broad range from being very, very well to being almost unwell. Um, and I think that's what we need to manage. We need to manage wellness. 
not illness. Because if we manage wellness, then illness decreases or, or becomes less prevalent. Um, so being active plays central in ensuring health and well-being. Inactivity is the fourth leading risk factor for global mortality, as you saw, and sedentary lifestyles are on the rise. 30% of the world's population are not meeting activity guidelines. Um, and again, I want to come back again to this, this. What does not work is preaching. What does not work is telling people what they're doing wrong and what they should do. What works is ownership, co-creation, and personal ownership. And tools which help people manage themselves are really, really important in this sense. Tools that they can in, engage with it, that in their time, in their space, in the way that they want to do it, are absolutely vital in terms of, of this buy-in to this, this improvement. Um, so, as I've said, there's a societal need to motivate and educate people to take control of their health. It's motivate and educate, it's not tell. This is about asking and, and working in partnership, not telling people what to do. Organisations, like many of the people represented on this webinar today, that's, that's your role, I believe. Your role is to help motivate and educate people, perhaps provide them with tools that they need to be able to m manage and motivate themselves. Um, provide education, increase understanding that health is determined by own life, life choice. I think people, are, and I use that um, analogy of the initial five minutes a day from people who are largely sedentary. That is so powerful. And I don't think individuals often realize quite how much an effect they can have in their own life choices and how much effect that can have in their health. Um, results in health and wellness benefits for everybody, of course, and this, many of the previous speakers already alluded to this. Um, and of course, uh, one of the main drivers, one of the things that, that I've, I've got on the screen here, the National Centre of Sport and Exercise Medicine, um, that's an Olympic legacy project from the 2012 Olympic Games in the UK to improve the um, nation's health through sport, exercise and physical activity. That's funded by the NHS. The National Health Service in the UK, with a specific reason to reduce um, demands on healthcare systems uh, in the UK. And of course, that's translatable around the world. That the, the, the more wellness you have, the less illness you have, the cheaper it is, frankly, in terms of your, your healthcare systems. Um, and the National Centre for Sport and Exercise Medicine uh, is a large multi million uh, dollar uh, programme um, in the UK involving uh, organizations from all over the country, and in fact, all over the world via the IOC network that Paul mentioned. Um, advancing in sport and exercise medicine, underpinning move towards improved public health and wellbeing is a massive movement in the, in the UK, and we know moving medicine, uh, exercise as medicine, some of you may have heard these terms, um, are global. They're not just UK terms, they're global terms. And this whole concept around um, sport and exercise medicine and again, although medicine is the term, actually, I prefer to use the, the, the term wellness, um, it's critical in the prevention and treatment of chronic diseases. And indeed, key technologies in informing lifestyle choices. I've talked a little about, we've heard about one, one example today from Sosa Health. Um, and, there are, and clearly people have access to a whole number of wearable devices and various ways that they can help monitor themselves. I'm all for that stuff. I think it needs to be brought together and unified um, so that we can can give people clear and clear messages, but I think that's really important. And I'm going to come back again and again. I, and I apologize if I'm, re well, I'm not, actually, I'm not going to apologize for repeating myself, actually. I think this is a really important message. The potential for significant and far reaching outcomes improve patient health and well being, indirect benefits of dependence, cost saving to the, the healthcare systems, as well as to employers, increased presenteeism, productivity, quicker return to work, mental resilience. Um, it, it cannot be underestimated the power of, 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 of some of these of some of these aspects. Um, I know we're we're tight for time, so um, I'm going to stop there. But um, just to re-emphasise, let's help people take ownership of their health. Let's not preach to people. Let's not tell people what they need to do. Let's help them. Let's work with them. Let's help them understand. Let's also realise that that in the whole world, in the entire global network. There is an underlying growth in, in issues around inactivity um, and people who are inactive are, are less physically robust and able to be able to deal with whatever comes their way. This year it's been COVID-19. It could be anything in the future about being physically and mentally robust and being ready for anything. I think that's kind of the key message I wanted to, uh, to um, give over today. Thank you very much. Mark. Um, thank you very, very much. Uh, what can I say? I think the, the word remarkable comes into to my mind that 
by that five minutes a day, you taking control to a certain degree and, and putting some lifestyle interventions, which is an individual's choice. We don't have to be told to do it. Um, it's today, it's immediate, it's free. Um, and, and the impact is significant, not only on your personal wellness, but how it impacts on your family, your friends, your business, and the, the community overall. Um, so whether it's corporate social responsibility or whether it's just us being happier in ourselves, our family, our social group and the community, um, it's, it's pretty dynamic. So thank you once again for that. Okay, everybody, we've got um, just over the hour. So we'd like to keep it going for just a little bit of time. If you can, if you can stay around, we've got five questions for the audience, uh, for the presenters um, in the chat box. So firstly, for Tom, um, I'm looking at another screen, guys, so you must, have, must apologize. Tom, if an organization is in stage four of staff return and COVID-19 cases started increasing again, can an organization return to stage three and two to reduce and minimize that risk? So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, that, that's the thing. It's about creating a ladder and, and what we often do, and it just comes back to general organizational resilience, um, where you have different impacts on the business. So you build different working models. Now, one might be half the staff in, half the staff out. One might be all remote and they should be flexible. But what you need is what are your dependencies? What are your minimum standards to move between each one? So if you, when you have other, other crises, you have loss of buildings, loss of staff, loss of systems, and it's all about understanding what's your working model when that impact happens. Now, the pandemic has multiple different impacts at the moment, and they're changing, they're ever-changing, whether it be the government guidelines, whether it be the, the number of health issues. So your models should very much be flexible to, to suit that, and you should know at each of those models, what are your minimum standards that you need to have to work in that model. Brilliant, thank you. Um, the next question is for uh, Dr. Gardenia. Does the physical space prevent healthy habits to the staff? And what is your advice to implement it on the staff? Did I make that clear? Shall I repeat it? I, can you please, yes? Can we go back to it, Mike, please? So we just uh, just lost it for a second. Does the physical space prevent healthy habits to the staff? And what is your advice to implement it on the staff? So I'm guessing the social distancing aspect. The social distancing aspect. So um, obviously physical distancing is necessary. There's no question about that. Um, I think the issue here is health anxiety and worrying about contracting COVID and how it needs to be managed in the workplace. So the situation in the firm that Tom was talking about with people kind of expressing how comfortable they are is one way of handling it. Um, having clear rules about physical distancing, setting places to have a space between chairs, um, using one desk and keeping another one empty, which is very difficult obviously to do, but it's necessary at this point in time. There's no way that we're ever going to, well, until the vaccine is around, we're not going to feel 100% comfortable. So the physical distancing is going to affect our mental well-being, but we don't need to allow it to prevent us from interacting and prevent us from communicating with each other. There's always ways around it. Okay, thank you for that. Mark, you raised your hand. Do you want to add to that? Yes, uh, yeah, thank you. I totally agree with that. And I think um, some of this uh, um, confidence comes from ownership as well. Ownership of, of, of the, the condition. We talked a little bit about um, how people can self-monitor, how people can 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 do work so i think some of that kind of that that confidence that that, that that we've just heard about also comes from ownership and i think ownership is really important 
important in terms of, of health that people take responsibility but I, responsibility makes again i don't you like using that word because it sounds directional it's kind of it's kind of um ownership of, of, of what happens and, and i think um you know some of that anxiety can be managed by um this virus um actually um it, it's although it is quite virulent uh, and and i'm you know i'm not for one second diminishing and not lives which have been lost to it at, at all however as a percentage of infected individuals it's a very low number it tends to be people as already talked about pre-existing conditions and over a certain age i think if people can be helped by understanding their health and understanding that situation i think that's really empowering for people knowledge is power in this sense it really helps people to sort of understand that how they can manage that risk themselves brilliant thank you uh, another question for uh, dr gardenia if you are living with a person with pre-existing conditions and therefore at high risk, uh, how do you feel safe going back into the workplace? <laughs> okay, so we are a society that is based on our family units and I think it causes more damage than good for the elderly in this part of the world to have to be forced into isolation and distancing. I've seen a large number of over 60s coming in just saying, we haven't seen our family. I'd rather catch COVID than continue this way. And I don't blame them. So personally, just like Mark said, we need to take responsibility. We need to practice the safety measures that have been recommended by the WHO, and we need to get on with our lives. We can't just put everything on freeze. That's the bottom line of it. You're not going to feel 100% safe until we have a vaccine. And Mark, you want to add to that? Just, just to add that anecdote from my organization, a large um, university with, with thousands and thousands of staff, um, we've had the same, I mean, all of the conversations you're having when I'm in my other hat as the Dean of the school, we're having the same conversations in our organization, how we bring people back. Um, and I, and I absolutely echo that point that we, we know, and, and I don't want this to, to be a morbid conversation, but in terms of our extended university community, there is no, there's no knowledge of anyone who has, um, died after contracting COVID-19, but sadly we do know of people who've taken their own lives because of the mental health strain that they've been put under uh, th when i heard that that actually made me take a gasp and take a step back so i utterly agree that we need to help people take ownership of the situation um and although it, there is as what as i think tom said there is unpredictability i think we need to help people manage that in the best way that they can thank you very much for that um there is a, a another question um which i think i can answer here uh, is SOSA Health available in Bahrain and is it available through medical insurance? Um, Tim and I have been working very hard on this to find a, a partner in Bahrain for SOSA Health and we're very happy uh, we're in final stages of negotiation with one of the leading hospitals in Bahrain who will be delivering this service from October uh, onwards. We're also uh, very proud that we're working with a company called Protection in Bahrain who are working with DHUB to find uh, relationships with the medical insurance so that the combination of the delivery partner which would be the hospital, the client which would be a business uh, or an institution, public or private, and then the medical health insurance industry come together to find a solution to this to make it readily available to a broad number of people. So that concludes the, the, the sort of the, the q and I'd like to thank you all the speakers for a most enjoyable and informative webinar. Uh, we've come onto the summary slide and uh, particularly like to thank the audience for attending and listening as well. And we'd just like to take some thoughts for you to take away. Firstly, the design and structure of the webinar was that we looked at the overall recovery plan and in particular, the organization resilience is key to implementing your recovery. Then Dr. Gardinia 
spoke about the social connectivity is vital for mental well-being within a team. Tim then covered how physical wellness and optimum wellness within the team is key to achieve optimum performance. And finally, Professor Mark Lewis talking about how to motivate and guide people to take control of their own health and wellness. And I'd like to just point out that the Bahrain Chamber of Commerce recently did a survey and one of the tips that they were promoting to accelerate recovery was try and avoid restrictions on the movement of human capital and ensure that occupational health and safety requirements are followed to reduce risk. So the next steps for everybody really is that we'd like you to engage with either one or all of the presenters. We've detailed the contact details uh, for information and engagement offers. So please contact me at paul at dhub.com. That's dhu3.com. But also as a health mean a partnership opportunities and also for some very exciting assessment offers. Please write to Tom at standbyconsulting.com and download some of their free resources and templates. And then for any appointments to see Dr. Gardenia Al Safa, either email Gardenia directly or go to the Royal Bahrain Hospital and make an appointment. For any international partnership opportunities and inquiries for SOSA Health outside of the MENA region, either contact info at sozahealth.com or go directly to the website. And anything regarding Professor Mark Lewis and Loughborough University, please contact me directly at info at dhub.com. This webinar has been recorded and will be posted on our YouTube site. And big thanks again to you all. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've got some good information and I hope you're motivated to engage with us. And the final thought again is that healthy people run and manage healthy companies better. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>